Today's episode takes us soaring into the skies of World War II. Imagine being thrust into the heart of enemy territory, where survival hinges on the bravery and bonds of a crew aboard their beleaguered B-17 bomber amidst anti-aircraft fire and enemy fighters closing in. We are joined by Steve Snyder, author of Shot Down, the true story of Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth, which will be linked in the description below. This story details the harrowing journey of his father, Howard, a B-17 pilot who was shot down over Nazi-occupied Belgium and escaped through the underground resistance. Enjoy the episode. So, Steve, welcome to American History Gazette. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here, Jake. Now, I don't think I've ever been looking forward to an episode this much. I mean, your father's story is absolutely remarkable, and your book was just incredible. Um, but first of all, I would like to thank your father for his service, and I would like to thank you for bringing this incredible story to light so that we can, we can appreciate your father as well. The story follows your father, Howard, who was a B-17 pilot, but where was he from and, and how did he find himself into the Air Force? Well, he was born in Norfolk, Nebraska, then he moved to California with his family when he was 13, right before he started high school. And uh, as a result of the first peacetime draft in history in the fall of 1940, uh, he registered and uh, went into the, the into service. Actually, he went into the Army uh, to begin with in uh, April of 1941, and he was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington. And uh, three months later, he got married to uh, Ruth Hempel in, uh, at First Lutheran Church in Pasadena. And uh, a few months after that, uh, on December 7th, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor and the United States was at war. Well, my mom was, uh, was, was wife, Ruth at that time, was you know, pretty nervous. Uh, the future was very uncertain. So she went up to Washington at Christmas time to visit my dad. And nine months later, uh, they had their first child, Susan Ruth Snyder. And so my dad was worried how he was going to support his new family because they didn't think he'd do, a very, do very well on a private's pay in the Army. So he decided to volunteer for the Air Force where he could make more money, especially if he made it through pilot training to become an officer. So that's how he got uh, into the, the Air Force, the Army Air Corps uh, back then. Interesting. So he, he answered the call for duty and he joins the Air Force for more pay. And what did pilot training look like at that time? Uh, there were three main stages uh, of pilot training. Uh, first was basic uh, training, and then if you made it through basic, you went into, uh, excuse me, primary training, and then if you made it through primary, you went into basic training. And pilot training was really tough, uh, both mentally and uh, physically, because you took a lot of college courses like meteorology and physics and uh, uh, so 40% uh, of the cadets that started got washed out and they became bombardiers or navigators or uh, maybe gunners. And then after basic, they going into advanced pilot training, they separated the pilots out. Uh, they either went into single engine planes, fighters, typically the, you know, the shorter pilots went into fighters because of the cramped condition of the cockpit. My dad was six foot three. So they went in, he went in to start the training, advanced training in uh, twin engine planes that, you know, once you, and he graduated from advanced pilot training at Douglas, Arizona in April of 1943, where he's earned his uh, commission as a second lieutenant and his pilot's wings. And then from there, he went to transitional crew training, where he learned how to fly a four engine B-17 bomber. And then from there, he went on to operational crew training, where the various members of the crew came together and they learned to operate as a team. And then when, once deemed ready, they were assigned overseas to the European Theater of Operations. And on October 21st of 1943, he and his crew reported to the 306 Bomb Group at Thurlai, England. Wow. So 40% of the cadets in pilot training washed out. That's pretty incredible. I mean, goes to show you that pilot training is no joke. I mean, it, it was definitely probably one of the, the hardest trainings there was in the US military at that time. But one of the one of the most interesting parts of of planes and, and the United States Air Force to me is the nose art on the on the planes because 
it, it, it's always so unique. It's always such a unique name or, or image and, and artwork. So what's the story behind the nose art on the bombers? Well, it's interesting that the Air Force was the only entity that allowed their planes to be painted. The Marines didn't, the Navy didn't, nor did other countries. But the Air Force thought it could help the morale of these young guys if they could personalize their planes. And, you know, and they were very creative in what they you know, painted on their planes and named their planes. Uh, many times it was a cartoon character, but more often than not, it was a scantily clad or, or nude woman. You know, after all, these guys were in their late teens and early 20s, so they were virile young men. Yeah, I love the nose art. Yeah, it, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is one of the most interesting parts of the Air Force, and it's super cool because if you give, you know, young testosterone-filled guys that kind of creative, creative freedom, you know, that's, that's the type of artwork you're going to get, I'm sure. But your father and his crew, they complete pilot training, and you said they, they report to the 306 Bomb Group. What was going through their heads as they were heading to England to go to war? Well, they had to be pretty nervous because they were actually a, a replacement crew, one of the replacement crews, after the dev devastating Schwecken, second Schweinfurt raid uh, called Black Thursday on October 14th of 1943. Um, it was one of four missions during what was referred to as Black Week in October. Where over those four missions, 148 bombers were shot down. That's almost 1,500 men. And on Second Schweinfurt, 60 bombers were shot down. That meant 600 men. And 10 out of the 15 plane B-17s of the 306 bomb group were lost. So they were reporting you right after that disastrous week and that disastrous mission. So they had to be pretty apprehensive. Yeah, especially because, you know, the bombing campaigns at that time, they'd already been going on for some time. And this was pre, you know, P-51 Mustang. So they didn't have the protection that they would have later in the war. So these, this was a very dangerous job. And I'm sure they were, they were probably definitely terrified after, you know, learning about the reputation and what was happening on these bombing raids, but they get to England and they get settled in at base. And what's, what's life like on base once they're settled in? Yeah. Another thing I'll mention that in, uh, April of 1943, uh, the flight surgeon from the 306 bomb group convinced 8th Bomber Command uh, Commander Ira Aker to implement a mission limit. Up until that time, the, the first mission of the 8th Air Force was on August 17th, 42, and there were no mission limits. And these combat crews realized that they'd never m make it home. They'd either be killed or shot down and become prisoners of war. Uh, and Thurman Schuler, Dr. Schuler, suggested a mission limit of 20 to Aker. He set it at 25, but at least they had you know, a light at the end of the tunnel and a goal they could shoot for. But in 1943, it was statistically impossible to complete 25 missions. The average number of missions flown before being shot down in 1943 was, was only six. So like you said, you know, they didn't have the fighter escorts at that time that could escort them deep into Germany and all the way to their target and all the way back. So they were very vulnerable to... Uh, enemy fighters. Yeah, I mean, that's terrifying. But life, uh, one of the, th two, two things really inspired me the most to, to, to write the book. And one was a diary that my dad wrote after he was shot down and missing in action about his plane being attacked. And it is just riveting. And then the other were all the letters that my dad wrote to my mother while he was stationed in England. And he was really candid in his letters. He talked about what missions, uh, combat missions were like, what life was like on the base, what life was like in England, in London at the time, escapade to him and his crew. And reading those letters was just f fascinating. So it was very interesting that uh, of, of, of that time, you know, not only the combat missions, but, you know, the downtime, because a lot of time the weather was really crummy in England, overcast, socked in, you know, rainy. And so a lot of times they couldn't fly, and then they would, you know. Thurlai was, the closest town to Thurlai was Bedford. And so they could ride their bicycles or, get, you know, get hop a jeep and, and go into Bedford. But, you know, the, the most exciting times were hopping on a train and then going down into London, you know, if you had a two-day pass and spend the night in, in London. But that was... Uh, 
a real thrill for these guys. You have to remember that, you know, back in the early 40s, the, U, the, country, the United States was a very different country. You know, most people lived out in the country, uh, not in cities. You know, and, and a lot of these guys that were just graduated from high school or, you know, they'd never been out of their home county. And all of a sudden, they're halfway around the world. And London at that time was the most exciting and the biggest city in the world. I mean, they'd never seen anything like that. And then here they are, away from home for the first time. These young guys, you, you, as you mentioned, with all this testosterone, they're getting good, you know, uh, airmen's pay. Uh, the U.S. airmen got paid a lot more than the British soldiers. They had money to spend on these British girls and take them out and buy them chocolates and, you know, uh, yeah, uh, hosiery and, and things like that. So there was a... Uh, a healthy supply of young British women for them to take to dances or to or to, to date. And, uh, you know, some of those guys, especially the single guys, my dad and two other members of his crew were married. My dad was the only one that had a child. And uh, my dad and also the bombardier, Richard Daniels, they were very uh, strong Christians. And so my dad, did, they didn't fool around, but the other two officers on the, on the crew uh, sure did. And so there's a, a number of, uh, you know, instances in the, the book about them going down into London. In London at that time, they were, you know, in the, at nighttime it was blacked out and they couldn't see where they were going, but they stumbled across speakeasies or something like that. And uh, so they, 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 they had their, their, their fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a fascinating point to make that most of these guys, they grew, they grew up in the same town and lived in the same town their entire lives like you said at that time in america that was just the way people lived so when you take that type of culture and then you just put them across the world in this crazy you know biggest city in the world at the time i'm sure they had quite the time does do you have any you know specific stories that stood out to you that your father that you read in your father's diaries about their debauchery in london these guys were just totally free, you know, that they could smoke, they could drink, you know, they could chase women, you know, their, their mothers and families weren't around, you know, no neighbors, relatives to see what they were up to. So it, it was, it was, it was quite an, uh, an adventure. Um, I remember one time when my dad went in, uh, they, they missed their train going back to base and they were supposed to go up on a mission the next day. And so they couldn't get back until the next morning. And my dad was really, you know, scared that what the commanding officer was going to say to him. Fortunately, that mission was scrubbed because of the weather and uh, they didn't go. But he got a dressing down from his commanding officer. But uh, his commanding officer was also the captain of the basketball team, which my dad played on. And so my dad played center and he was a pretty good uh, basketball player. So the, the commanding officer gave him some, you know, some slack uh, <laughs> because of that. Yeah, he gave him some leeway because he was helping him out on his team. That's funny. But these bombing campaigns were a crucial aspect of the war effort. I mean, this was no small, small operation. I mean, there were bases all over England. So just how massive of an operation were these bombing campaigns and how much infrastructure was required to conduct these operations? Because I'm sure they had to have, you know, numerous airfields that were that were just giant. Yeah, there were about 40 uh, bomb groups in the 8th Air Force. And these bases were located only 5 to 10 miles apart in an area called East Anglia. Uh, in England, which was about the size of Vermont. So on the day of a mission, you could have hundreds of bombers taking off at the same time. And usually the weather was crummy, like I, I mentioned, and uh, you know, it socked in with clouds, and uh, they couldn't see anything until they got above the cloud layer. And back there, there was no radar, radar there was no air traffic control, so mid-air collisions were very you know, frequent. Um, and then they had to form up. Uh, individual planes formed up into three plane elements, elements formed up into bomb squadrons, bomb squadrons formed up into bomb groups, bomb groups formed up into combat wings, combat wings formed up into air divisions. And all this took an hour to two hours before they could even begin their, their mission across the, the English Channel. So it, it was a huge o operation on these days of missions. 
Yeah, that's incredible. I don't think people realize, especially for the, the bigger missions, how many planes were up in the sky. I mean, can you imagine hundreds of bombers just crossing the English Channel to bomb, you know, whatever their target was? The sight that that was was probably incredible. And the logistics that went into that probably had to be airtight because you mentioned midair collisions were a huge, um, huge problem, especially without the radar. But what were the logistics that went into, you know, preparations for the missions? How did they choose their targets and, and how much planning went into each mission? Well, 8th Bomber Command would uh, decide, you know, what targets would be. Um, and, you know, then they had, you know, all these uh, meteorologists that would be tracking the weather because they had, the, you know, not only the weather in England, but what the, was the weather going to be like over the target once they got there. And then anticipating what uh, enemy fighter uh, you know, attacks were going to be like. Also, the, they had flak stations and uh, aircraft uh, artillery, you know, set up at different spots, you know, to, to protect targets and how bad the flak, uh, you know, would be. And then they would... Uh, on their briefings, that you be briefed about all this, and also what their uh, um, their route would be to the target, and then coming back home from the target, because they had one route to the target, and then they took another route coming back from the target, and uh, you know what landmarks to look for, and then they had a pre-designated point called the initial point, the IP. And that's where they would start their bomb run. When they got close to the target, they'd make a turn and then, you know, head toward the, their, their target, which would be like 20 to 50 miles away uh, at, at that time. And so, you know, once 8th Bomber Command decided, you know, what they were, when they were going to go, where they were going to go, they'd relay, relay that to the, the bomb groups. And then the bomb group, you know, commanding officers would relay that to the combat crews. And then uh, they'd get ready and get their gear on and go out to their planes and uh, uh, rev their planes up and start taxiing and then they head out on their on their mission. Yeah, and they were flying these missions, you know, sometimes once a day, very frequently, right? Yeah, it was it was really hit and miss. You know, some days they'd go, you know, several days or you know a week or ten days without flying a mission because of the weather. And then, then other times they'd go up like several days in a row. They just they just never knew. You know, and that was one of the things about this, you know. Every mission could be their last. And they had friends and acquaintances that would go down and either be missing in action or, or, or killed. And so they, every time they went up, it could be their last. The courage and the bravery that was required to step up into that cockpit or into that plane day after day, mission after mission, knowing that it could be your last, especially with the high casualty rates with the bomb runs at that time is just to not be understated. It's absolutely incredible what these men did, you know, to, to lay the groundwork for D-Day ultimately, but they were flying B-17s, B-17 bombers, and the B-17s were referred to as the flying fortress. Can you tell me why that is? It was because of the armament they had on, on the plane. They had 12 to 13 50 caliber machine guns, so they could put out a tremendous amount of firepower. And also they could really take a tremendous amount of battle damage. Uh, the 1st and 3rd Air Divisions in the 8th Air Force flew B-17s, and then the 2nd Air Division flew B-24 Liberators. Uh, they could take, uh, the Liberators couldn't take as much punishment as the B-17s. So, uh, you know, the, those, when you talked to B-17 veterans, you know, they would come back and their planes would be all shot up, uh, flight controls out, engines shot out, you know, holes all over the plane. And these planes were so rugged, they would, you know, bring them back to, uh, to their base. So they, those guys who flew the B-17s really loved them. Yeah, it's crazy to see the pictures of some of the, the really, you know, battle-worn B-17s coming back to base. And you're wondering how the heck did did that thing keep flying and make it back to base? Cause I mean, some of them were just completely like gaping holes in the wings. It, it's crazy that these were really resilient planes, but they were, you know, up there at, at, you know, roughly 20,000 feet. 
these cabins weren't pressurized so they're just up there in the elements i mean what were the conditions like that high up and i know flying a plane like that is physically demanding how physically demanding was it to fly the plane yeah, as you mentioned, they weren't pressurized, so above 10,000 feet they had to go on oxygen, or if not, they'd pass out in a couple minutes and die. And also, it was minus 40 to 60 degrees below zero, so frostbite was a huge problem, and many airmen were hospitalized for lengthy periods of time because of their frostbite injuries. One of my dad's waist gunners was in the hospital for two and a half months because of the seriousness of the, the frostbite that, that he had. And as you mentioned, you know, back then you really, it took muscle to fly these planes and you needed to, you had, to, you know, my dad was the first pilot. He sat in the left seat and then the co-pilot sat in the right seat. And you needed two pilots to fly these planes and not just because if one was injured or killed, you had another guy that could do the job. But these missions were 10 or 6 to 10 hours in length, so it was very tiring, uh, both mentally and physically. Uh, they flew in tight formation, so you had to stay alert at all times or else you could clip a wing on the plane and next to you or run into the plane in front of you and go down, and that happened. And then you had to continue, these pilots had to continually fight the air, air turbulence. You know, you had the normal turbulence of weather, which most of us experienced, but then you had the turbulence from all those bombers being in such close proximity to one another. So the wake turbulence and the prop wash would just churn the air up, you know, like a washing machine. So it really took muscle to hold onto that yoke and keep these planes, you know, in formation. So yeah, it, it, and you know, and, the, the, and then we had, and that's before they encountered enemy fighters or anti aircraft fire. Yeah, it's crazy to think about and. They're up there. These missions last hours at a time. I mean, they leave in the morning, they get back in the afternoon. You can imagine keeping that level of focus, you know, amidst war zones in the air, enemy fighters, anti-aircraft turbulence, and then the physical strain of having to pilot the aircraft was probably so draining for for the crew and, and the pilot. I mean, especially if they go a couple days in a row of doing missions every day, you can imagine how exhausted they would probably feel after. Did your father ever write in his diaries how exhausted he probably was? Oh, yeah. He talked about that all the time. These guys, I mean, a lot of times they, they, they were too tired. They just wanted to sleep, you know, you know, forget going out and carousing. You know, after these missions, they would, like you say, just be exhausted uh, from the strain and the stress uh, of, of these missions. And they just wanted to go back to their barracks and just go to sleep. Yeah, and, and also the adrenaline crash was probably part of that too. But we alluded to it a little bit earlier, and that is the flak, the anti-aircraft fire. And when you're watching movies, they kind of just are playing video games. They kind of just look like little black puffs of smoke in the sky. But this was really intense stuff. I mean, this could just really blow up the plane on a direct hit. And this, this was no joke. They were not just little black puffs. So can you walk me through what flak was and why it was so deadly? Yeah, the, uh, their aircraft, uh, well, flak came as an abbreviation of, of the German word for aircraft defense cannon. And these guns were deadly weapons. They fired 20 shells a minute, and the shells were calibrated to explode at the same altitude that these bombers were flying. And the shells were filled with all different shapes and sizes of razor-sharp metal, referred to as shrapnel, that when they would explode, they'd burst out hundreds of feet and easily penetrate the thin aluminum skin of these bombers. I mean, the, the aluminum skin was so thin that you could take a screwdriver and just poke right, right through it. And as you said, from a distance, they looked like innocent black puffs, but then once you got into that killing field, those puffs got bigger. The explosions became deafening. You know, if a shell exploded near the the, the ship, it would just violently rock the, the, the bomber. If it had a direct hit, uh, the plane would basically explode and just disappear. Or if a shell hit a wing, you know, that bomber would just drop like a, a stone, you know, 25,000 feet, you know, or five miles down to the ground. My dad said even though it was so cold at that altitude on these bomb runs, you're going through that flak, he would just be dripping wet and his clothes would be soaked with sweat from, you know, the adrenaline running through his body. That's incredible. And that, that was only half the battle on these bomb runs. I mean, 
not to mention the turbulence we talked about earlier. You have the flak, but then you also have enemy fighters out here trying to kill you. Somewhere upwards of over 100 enemy fighters, you know, attacking a formation, which is crazy. So how often were the crews attacked by the Luftwaffe? And what was their strategy of defense against the oncoming attacks? Well, yeah, the, uh, they, would, they would hit enemy fighters both going in, you know, before they bombed the target, and then also on the way back home after bombing the target. So they had to face the, the, the fighters twice. And uh, as we mentioned early in the war, they didn't have fighters that could escort them all the way to the target until the P-51 Mustangs came in. Right at the end of 1943, the beginning of 1944. And the, their main defense, well, at the beginning of the war, it was 8th Bomber Command's belief that these, you know, heavily armed bombers flying in tight formations with all that, you know, all those machine guns could ward off the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. But uh, that was not the case. Um, they could not do it without, uh, you know, escort fighters. Um, and so the, the, it was really important to fly tight formations and the bomb groups, you know, there were some bomb groups that were better at flying tight formations than other bomb groups. But if you had a loose formation and you didn't, you know, fly, you weren't flying wingtip to wingtip, that allowed the fighters to come in uh, into the formation and pick, uh, you know, different bombers off. So that was their main defense, uh, staying in tight formation and then having all that fi firepower. But uh, until they got escort fighters, it, it, you know, it really wasn't effective. It seems that they kind of overestimated the Flying Fortress name of the B-17. And of course, they had all that firepower, but, you know, getting shot down by the enemy aircraft was a huge problem. But they get to their IP, like you said earlier, and they turn and they go about their bombing run. So what... What was the bombing run, and, and what went into, you know, executing a good bombing run? Oh, well, when they got to the IP, the first pilot would give control over the, of the plane over to the bombardier, who would actually fly the plane through the Norton bomb site. It was tied into the autopilot uh, of the plane, and it was a revolutionary device at the time. It could calculate, it was an analog computer that could calculate various factors, such as the the altitude the plane was flying, the speed of the plane, the wind speed, wind direction, so you could accurately calculate, you know, where it uh, dropped the bomb so it, they would hit near the, the target. And then once they got uh, to the target, the uh, bombardier would release the bombs, then he'd yell, bombs away, and that would signal the first pilot to take control back of the plane, and then he would make a big turn and go to another pre-designated point called the rally point, where the bombers that made it through the bomb run would try to form up again and then head back to their bases uh, in, in England. Well, how many tons of bombs are they dropping on these bombing runs? What's the destruction level like for you know the bombing runs? Because some of them, I mean, you can imagine if it's if it's a big mission with you know a couple hundred aircraft, they could probably level a city. You know what I mean? At the beginning of the war, before really the air war started, you know the. They, they touted the Norton bombsite uh, being so good that you could drop a bomb in a pickle barrel. But that was not the case because back in the States when they were training, you know, they were flying in Arizona or Texas where the weather was clear, you know, no clouds, and it was always clouds in Europe, you know, during the air war. And they were practicing their bomb runs at 5,000 feet, you know, not 25,000 feet. Um, not being attacked by enemy fighters, not having flak exploding all around you. So the bomb accuracy wasn't near as good as what they thought it was going to be. And that's one of the reasons you had to have all those bombers. Because the bomb loads really weren't that big. Um, they might have, you know, 12 bombs on a, a plane, 500 bomb, bombs. And they, ha they really needed all those bombers dropping all those bombs to make an effective, you know, uh, mission, and that's that's why they had to do. You know, today you can take one stealth bomber and you know accomplish what hundreds of B-17s accomplished during during World War II because they can put it in a pickle barrel. You know, and the bombs are so much more 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 powerful. So yeah, they uh, the the Eighth Air Force got its uh, moniker the Mighty Eighth because of the number of bombers that they put up on missions, 
in a de December 24th of 1944, 2,000 bombers hit targets around Berlin. I mean, that's unimaginable. I mean, as some bombers are dropping their bombs on around Berlin, other bombers hadn't even taken off from England yet. You know, 2,000. So yeah, that by the by the end of the war, they were just they were, they were just uh, putting hundreds and hundreds of of, of, of bombers up on, on on these missions, and they needed them to to be effective to try to hit the target. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. I can't even imagine what that would look like, and especially the terror the German people probably felt because you mentioned some are dropping bombs and others hadn't even taken off yet. So this is a very long long process of just getting continuously bombed that just unrelenting and Europe and, and Germany especially was just probably completely in ruins by the end of the war from these bombing campaigns but you mentioned earlier that when they start making their way home they're encountering enemy fighters again so after they drop their bombs the this the, the the mission isn't over I mean they still have enemy fighters to encounter on their way home and then landing and coordinating all the landings for all the bombers is probably a whole nother problem. So what, what, what was the process of making it home after their bombing run? Oh, yeah. Even when they did, you know, if they did make it back to England, they faced a number of dangers. Uh, the weather could be socked in and they couldn't even find their bases to, to land. Uh, they could be running out of fuel. Uh, they could have injured or dead pilots on board. Uh, they could have a lot of b battle damage, uh, engines out, flight controls out, landing gear that wouldn't come down. So again, coming back to their bases, uh, crash landings were frequent, and their and more airmen, you know, could lose their lives. So I mean, it was dangerous from the time they took off to the time they got back and landed. That's crazy. It's just you're living in in constant danger, especially when you're up in the air. You're right. From the moment they step into the plane to the moment they get out of it, it is just constant danger. And and the casualty rate and the danger rate was, was a lot higher than it was on even the front lines, which is something I feel like, which is something I feel like a lot of people don't realize because, you know, you see D-Day and you see the front lines pushing towards Berlin and, and that was truly awful fighting, especially in the Pacific with the unrelenting Japanese. But, but people don't realize that it was actually a lot more dangerous to fly these bombers than it was to be even on the front lines. Yeah, the 8th Air Force, uh, there were 26,000 men killed in the 8th Air Force, which is more than the entire Marine Corps fighting in the Pacific. Being a combat crewman in the 8th Air Force was the most dangerous duty assignment in the United States military during World War II. That is remarkable when you put it that way, that more crewmen in the 8th Air Force died than the entire Marines in the Pacific. And we all know how how awful and, and bloody and, and ruthless the fighting in the Pacific was. So it really puts it into perspective when you look at it like that. But your, your father came in as a replacement because, you know, the bombing had been going on. Planes are going down. He comes in as a replacement. So how does his his first few missions go and, and how did he feel about them? Um, They went uh, pretty well. Um. He said, you know, it, it, you know, going up the, the first couple of times, he was pretty nervous. But then he wrote that, you know, he had uh, he got over the fear and uh, he would write back home in these letters uh, that, you know, it, he had a job to do. And you know, he, he was my dad was also older than most of the guys. He was 28. So he was an old guy. You know, the gunners typically were in their teens, 18, 19 the other officers on the crew uh, were typically in their early 20s. So my dad was pretty mature, you know. He, he was, he had, you know, he was an assistant manager for a, for a company. Um, you know, he was 28, he was married, so he, he, was, he, he was a lot more mature. And I think he you know, was able to, and he had a strong, you know, belief in, in God too, that I think helped him get through, get through, through these missions. Um, and I mean, the, the adrenaline would be pumping him up, but you know, he, it was his responsibility as the first pilot, he was the commander of the crew and of the plane. So uh, he focused on his job of getting that plane to the target and getting it in it back home. Uh, on one of his missions, uh, one of the engines were shot out, but besides that on the missions of, before he got shot down, um, he didn't really have that much of a problem. 
he got he was shot down on his on his eighth mission. I'm sure he got a lot of jokes about being the old man of the crew, especially being much older than everyone. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure the faith in God definitely helped him, and I know a lot of the crewmen once they set that mission limit of 25 at first that a lot of them actually wanted to go up in the air. They were, they were, you know, volunteering for missions and they wanted to go up because they wanted to get those missions out of the way so they could get back home. So even though you're nervous and you're scared, you know, you want to get those missions out of the way so you can get back to your family. Right. Yeah. He wrote in his letters all the time that, you know, he just wanted to fly as often as he could. And when missions were scrubbed because of a mechanical failure on the plane or weather, you know, it, just ate at him and he hated that you know especially you know because sometimes they would they would get in their planes and be in their plane with their engines running waiting to take off and the and the and the mission would be scrubbed well they went through all that you know mental anguish of gearing themselves up for this mission you know and 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 oh gosh we're going out again we're going out again ah oh, shit you know and and then it scrubbed, and so that and then you just deflated after that. And so, yeah, he he hated it. He just wanted to get his missions over and get get home to his wife and his and his baby girl. Well, let's get into you know part two of your story now. This is this is where this is where the bloody business begins for your father. You mentioned on his eighth mission, he is shot down on his bomb on his you know his bombing run, and. He was in the Susan Ruth. He gets shot down. Walk me through, you know, moment by moment, what it looked like for him and his crew as they got shot down. Yeah, they were, uh, well, their bomb bay door, they, they dropped their bomb successfully on a, over Frankfurt. Uh, but their bomb, bomb bay doors got hit by flak, and they couldn't get the, the doors back up. And as a result, that caused a drag in the plane. They lost airspeed, and they fell behind the formation you know, going back to England, and they were singled out by two German Fock Wolf 190 f fighters. And like, you know, lions or wolves on prey, they came in for the kill in the ensuing air battle. The Susan Ruth was, sh was shot down. Um, they just made one pass, my dad said, and just shot the heck out of them. Um, two of the crewmen died on the plane, and the plane was on fire. And so uh, uh, the other eight guys, a B-17 and a 10-man crew, were able to bail out. Uh, but both those Fock Wolf fighters were shot down as well. One was piloted by Siegfried Merrick. His plane crashed, and he died in the plane. He's buried at the Lamel uh, German Cemetery in Belgium. And the other pilot, Hans Berger, uh, was able to bail out, uh, and he made it through the war. And as uh, a, a side like, you know, when I was doing my research, one day my wife says, well, Steve, why don't you try to find the pilot, the German pilot that shot down your dad's plane? And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, she's being so naive. She doesn't know what she's talking about. It'd be impossible. You know, he probably died in the war like most of the German pilots did. Or it's 70 years later, you know, he's probably passed on by now. Or I can't speak German and communicate with him. But like a good husband, I did what she told me to do. And I found Hans Berger. And fortunately for me, he became a translator after the war and spoke perfect English. And he gave me some wonderful insight in the that's, uh, what, that's in the book about what it was like to go up against the 8th Air Force. And I learned from Hans that the gunners on my dad's plane shot him down at the same time he shot down my dad's plane. They shot each other down. And uh, Hans and I became friends. Um, I made two trips to Munich uh, to visit him. Uh, unfortunately, he just recently uh, uh, died on January 20th at 100 years of age. So that was one of the highlights of my life, I think, finding Hans Berger. <laughs> yeah, that's just an absolutely incredible story that, that really just puts the cherry on top to this whole book and this whole story. Because can you imagine the coincidence and the odds of not only making it through the war, but living that old, becoming a translator, and then you picking up your father's story to research about it, and then finding each other, and then becoming friends? It's like, it's like a story out of an alternate history novel, you know? But your father, when I was reading your book, he talks, you know, he wrote in his diary moment by moment what he was feeling as he was getting shot down. And he said flames that just engulfed the cockpit. 
And I remember something that was very profound to me was he said that time slowed down. The adrenaline was pumping so much through his veins that he, he talked about time slowing down. And obviously war is terrible and getting shot down, I'm sure, wasn't a fun experience. But he said he almost missed that feeling, that adrenaline. It was almost like a good feeling. And I interviewed a Vietnam veteran um, a couple episodes ago, and he also said the same thing about the adrenaline he felt in combat and how how guys would miss it and that's that it led to a lot of you know very bad vices after the war when when guys would come home but can you just walk me through how your your father was feeling and what was going through his head as you know the cockpits engulfed in flames what's you know what's he trying to do to get out well he didn't know what was going on uh in the back of the plane you know between the uh in front of the Bombay are the two pilots, uh, the, the, the four officers, the navigator, the, the bombardier, and also the, the flight engineer, the top turret gunner. Then you have the Bombay, and then behind the, the Bombay is the radio operator, the two waste gunners, the ball turret gunner, and the tail gunner. Um, his oxygen tanks exploded in the cockpit, so that's what started the fire. So he had no idea what was going on behind him. He was, just knew what was going on in the cockpit and then uh, in, the, in the nose of the plane. And his co-pilot, George Ike, was just terrified. He, he, he was just froze in the pilot. And my dad at first was uh, stunned and he actually lost consciousness. He didn't really know how long he was out, um, but he, he came to in the the cockpit's you know, on fire, flames. He tries to take a little extinguisher to put out the flames, but like he said in, in his diary, it did as much good as like, you know, with a, a eyedropper trying to put these, these flames out. So then he tried to get out of his seat, and, and at first he couldn't get out of his seat because um, he had his uh, seat belt on, and he, didn't, he couldn't understand. Well, normally he buckled his, his seat belt uh, over his flak jacket, but for some reason he did it under his flak jacket on this mission. So he was all disoriented and, and finally figured out, though, uh, that, oh, that, that's, that's what happened. He had to kind of concentrate, and that's what he, where he kind of came to and got a little control over himself, but he was still terrified. Um, and then, you know, he hits the bailout bu bu button and, and uh, a bell, but he doesn't know whether anyone... Could, could hear it or not. He just assumed that or hoped that they had b bailed out of the plane. And so, you know, he tells Ike and uh, Benninger and uh, Daniels, the other officers, you know, to bail out. Uh, and then he was the last, being the, you know, the commander of the plane, he was the last one in, in, the, in the front of the plane uh, to bail out. So it was pure terror and, and chaos in that plane. Terror and chaos are probably the two perfect words to describe that scenario. But eight of the ten bailout, two unfortunately died in in the crash or, you know, in the plane being shot up. But your father lands over Nazi-occupied Belgium, close to the Belgium-French border. So what he lands and, and what are his first actions on the ground? I mean, you can imagine he probably has no no clue where he's at, where to go. So what is his what are his first actions you know, another thing, too, about all these guys bailing out, you know, they weren't paratroopers. These guys had never practiced a jump before. They got some classroom, you know, instruction of what to do. But here they are, five miles above the ground, and, you know, they're looking <laughs> straight down, and they they go, Shh, you know, they're just hoping, oh, man, I hope this parachute opens. You know, I hope I remember what to do. You know, they say, you know, count so many seconds and then pull the, the, the rip cord. But, you know, some guys who bailed out, you know, their parachutes got hung up on the plane or their parachute didn't open. So there was not a, you know, sure thing that you would even make it down to the ground once you jumped out of the plane. Um, but, yeah, he, he bailed out successfully and his, he came down on some trees right at the French-Belgian border. And his parachute got hung up on the branches of the tree. And it was dangling 20 feet off the ground, and he couldn't get down. But fortunately for him, a couple of young Belgian men, Henri Franklin and Raymond Trevin, came to his rescue before the Germans got to him. Uh, they got a ladder from uh, the Trevin uh, house and helped him. They, in a rope, 
they swung him to a tree so that he climbed down the ladder from the tree. Uh, this happened uh, in early afternoon. They told him to, to stay put and hide because they thought it was too dangerous to try to move him in daylight with German patrols combing the area. But that night they came back and got him and they took him to the Durvan farmhouse. He had some shrapnel wounds in his legs, not too serious, uh, but they gave him some first aid there. And then he only stayed there one night because, again, they thought it was too dangerous with those German patrols uh, still in the area. So on the next night, a Belgium customs officer, Paul Tilcan, uh, came uh, and got him on a tandem bicycle to take him to a safer location. And uh, when they took off, it was the middle of night. My dad said it was uh, rainy, and he could only pedal with his good leg. And when they got to a hill, they couldn't pedal the bike anymore, so they started pushing it up the hill. And they came to a, a ca little cafe. The lights were on, music was playing, people were laughing, talking loudly. And all of a sudden, two German officers uh, come out the front door with a couple of young French girls, and one of them puts his arm around my dad and asks him for a light for a cigarette. And my dad couldn't speak German. At that time, he couldn't speak French, so he's, you know, petrified. He doesn't know what to do. But Paul, you know, knew what they wanted and lit the guy's cigarette, and they let him go on their way. My dad said these two guys were too drunk and too interested in these two young girls to pay much attention to a couple of guys pushing a bike up in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the night in the rain, so they let them go on their way. And after that, my dad was just moved from place to place to place. How long he stayed in any given location depended on how brave the Belgian people were who lived there and how dangerous the Belgium underground thought it was for him to stay there. He might spend one night, might spend six weeks. That's incredible. What a close call. I mean, to be to be walking in the middle of the night and two German officers walk out, I can imagine how terrified he must have felt. But he gets into contact with the Belgium underground, and they're helping him out, like you said, moving him place to place. So there's a lot of people involved here. But how extensive of an operation was the underground resistance? Yeah, he was fortunate uh, that my, they were, he was, my dad wasn't that uh, badly injured uh, and was picked up by the resistance because some of the other guys that bailed out of the plane had, you know, very ser serious injuries. Um, and some were picked up by the resistance and some were picked up by, by, the, by the Germans. Um, but it had to be, you know, uh, <laughs> it's so stressful. You know, first his plane's attacked, it's on fire, he's, you know, has to bail out. He comes down a foreign country, has no idea where he is, um, doesn't know what happened to his buddies on the crew, can't communicate with the U.S. military, and he's being uh, helped by total strangers. Uh, th th they really can't communicate at the beginning. He had a little French-English dictionary that he could refer to, but he couldn't speak French, they couldn't speak English. And any one of these people... Helping him could turn out to be a collaborator and to turn him over, turn him over to the to the Gestapo. So you know, it was very stressful for him. But I can't emphasize enough the courage and the bravery on the part of those Belgian people that helped my dad or you know any downed airman in any of the occupied countries because they risked their lives, not only their lives but their lives of their family and friends because of the Gestapo. The secret police found out about it; they would be arrested tortured and either shot or sent to a concentration camp. And some of the people who helped my dad and other members of his crew did meet that fate. So they were unbelievably brave people. Yeah, 100%, because we all know how cruel the Gestapo and the SS was, and they really were completely risking their lives. And you're right, the lives of their entire families, because that's what the Gestapo would do if, if they caught them, just to help out these complete strangers who they never met, who are just down to airmen. So you're you're completely right. I completely agree. And it is not to be understated the courage of these people because you can imagine after living, I mean, their country was occupied for years leading up to that. So they're just living in constant terror and they're still going above and beyond to help out these American airmen who they don't know. And and it's also crazy how you said, how you, you know, how you, Put it into perspective how stressful it must have been for your father and all those downed airmen every single day you don't know if you're talking to a collaborator you don't know if today's going to be the day you get caught after having to bail out of you know getting shot up just the amount of stress i don't think anyone of this generation 
can fathom because we've never had to experience anything like that. But what was day to day life like for your father while he was evading capture? Because I'm sure were those were their, those moments of urgency that, you know, they had to move. Maybe Germans were coming, but there were also kind of moments of downtime, I'm sure. So what was day to day life like? Yeah, well, as we mentioned, he came down right at the French Belgian border uh, in the uh, municipality of Montmagny. And then the largest little town was Chimay. Uh, and they built a, a memorial to my dad and his crew later, uh, years later. But they, he didn't stay in that area very long. They moved him up uh, about an hour. Uh, well, if you were today driving, it'd be about an hour north, not quite an hour, to a, a, a large, much larger city, Charleroi, where they thought you know he could hide a lot easier because the city was so much, you know, larger and there were so many more people, unlike, you know, a little village uh, or, or a tiny town where everyone knew everyone and, you know, it'd be a lot uh, more difficult to, to hide. And so he went up to Charleroi and he stayed there with uh, quite a few people. And uh, fortunately for him, uh, one couple that he stayed with, uh, Maurice and Ghislaine Bayou, uh, I forget his occupation off the top of my head, but uh, he had a pretty good job and they, they had money. My dad said, if you stayed with somebody that had some money, you ate pretty good. But if you didn't, you know, you're eating, you know, bread made with sawdust and coffee made with acorns. Um, and uh, when my dad was with the Bayou's next door uh, lived a, a woman with her young daughter, 16 year old daughter, Mimi Gabriel, and she could speak English. And so she would come over every day and they would play crossword puzzles and uh, do, uh, do puzzles, play, you know, board games. And she taught them how to speak conversational French. And uh, they had a, a nice home there. I've been inside that, that home and a nice little backyard uh, where, they, where they could sit. I mean, my, my dad... You know, they gave him civilian clothes, although they didn't fit too well, being six foot three, because most of the Belgian people were pretty short, so he always had high water pants, you know, and they put a beret on his head, so he'd tr try to blend in, in a little bit. And when they moved him, sometimes he would ride bicycles, sometimes he'd go on the train, sometimes he'd take a, a bus. And then, there are a number of instances in, in the book that are pretty interesting where he, you know, was almost uh, discovered by the Germans, or was on a train with Germans, and then the, the, he was staying with another w woman, Eva Martin, and she had two young daughters, you know, one at 18, one 22, and they would take him on the train and, you know, kind of pr protect him, and, you know, Germans would be sitting right there. So it, it, you know, that had to be, you know, one slip-up. <laughs> uh, he had a false identity card, and on that it said he was a, a, a you know, deaf and dumb, you know, he was a mute. So he didn't have to talk, um, but still, yeah, they, it's it, it, and you know that, that's why you know eventually he got he got tired of of hiding because it was just so so, so stressful, you know. And one time it, it was at the Bayou house, there was a pounding on the door at night, and Maurice told him to get up on the on the roof, and he'd come back and get him uh, when the Germans left. But they stayed around the whole night. My dad stayed on the roof the the whole night. And I've, I've been in that house, and you get up on the roof, and there's an attic, a small attic, and a little tiny window. You know, you just had to barely squeeze, and the roof is really, you know, at a st uh, steep angle. It's all tile. I can't imagine crawling out, trying to crawl out of that, uh, that little tiny window and getting up there. But, yeah, there's, there's a number of instances described in the book where, yeah, it got, you know, touch and go there for a while. Yeah, that's incredibly terrifying and incredibly stressful i mean i can't Im can't imagine being on a train with you know two german officers sitting there or something and you just you know your hands are sweating and you just got to stay silent but you mentioned he he got very impatient and he got tired of running and hiding and this led him to join the Mackey, which were the french resistance who were you know fighting the germans who were occupying their country so how did he get into contact with the Mackey, and who who were they uh, well, word came, uh, you know, that the Allies had landed at Normandy, D-Day, on June 6th, and uh, he, he knew that they would be coming up through France, and so he decided to, uh, you know, get back in the fight. His helpers, 
uh, tried to talk him out of it because it was so dangerous. You know, if fighting against the Germans, he could get shot and killed. Or if they captured him, he'd be executed on the spot for being a terrorist. But, and, you know, I've often thought about this, you know, what actually made him do that. Because the smart thing and safest thing to do would just stay hunkered down and hiding and wait for the U.S. armies to come up and liberate that area. Um, and how many people would have made that decision, you know, to risk their lives doing that, I, I don't know if I would have done it. But he felt it was his duty to get back into the fight. Um, there were U.S., you know, military men, you know, soldiers who were fighting and dying, and he felt it was his duty to, to get back in the fight. So he did talk one of his helpers, Amy Cools, to, uh, they got on bicycles and they rode down to the French border and she made connections, you know, through the underground, uh, hook them up with a unit of the French resistance, uh, as you said, uh, called the Mackey, which were small ragtag guerrilla groups located all across France. And uh, their job was to harass the Germans. Uh, they would attack railroad lines, sabotage communications, uh, attack convoys, assassinate German officers. They'd get their information uh, from the British through coded messages over the BBC. And my dad said that the information they gave him was unbelievably accurate. They said if a German convoy was coming down this road on this day at, ta at this time, sure enough, they'd be there. And that was a result of the British having cracked the uh, German Enigma code and knowing everything that the Germans were, were up to. And then they were also supplied by the British through, through airdrops. So, you know, that must have been an experience, too, for my dad. So, you know, this, the, the, this Mackey unit, it was led by a French lieutenant uh, who had escaped from a German prisoner of war camp. And so you had this group of guys. There were some Belgians and, you know, uh, from some Frenchmen and some Algerians who, you know, fought for the French because that was a French colony at the time. And they're contacted and say, hey, this guy wants to join your group. They, well, they had to be very suspicious because you know, the Germans had infiltrators all, all the time trying to get into different networks and uh, find out what was going on. So they had to be very leery, leery about my dad. Like, who is this guy? You know, can we trust him? And, but, you know, you know, he, he could speak conversational French at that time, and the underground said, no, you know, he's a legit U.S. airman. You know, we cut him down from a tree, and, you know, his plane came down here. And so they and he said, you know, I, he had that, unlike most airmen, he had that year's experience in, in the infantry training. So he knew how to fight on the ground. Uh, you know, a, a typical airman would have no idea how to fight on the ground. So I think that's another thing that, you know, kind of led him to, to decide to do this. And so he fought with the uh, French resistance for, for a couple months, and uh, encounters they had with the Germans are described in the book, you know, that had to be pretty, pretty, pretty exciting. And they lived a uh, uh, farmhouse, which I've been in, and uh, just over the border into France. No, it really is. Like, beginning to end, it's just an absolutely incredible story. It, it Like I said earlier, it kind of seems like a historical... Uh, fiction novel just the story of your father and all the events that he went through but I mean kudos to him the bravery to to get back into the fight after he'd already been shot down you know because he recognized the evil of Nazi Germany and 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 what needed to be done in order to to get rid of them but there's an incredible photograph of, in your book of an action shot of your father in action with the Mackey you know in the middle of some kind of skirmish with the Germans, I'm sure. But it's just, it's incredible that even in the safe hiding, not necessarily safe, but hiding with the Belgian people, you know, he was still willing to step up to fight for, for what was right. That is an unbelievable picture. And who took it and how it ever got back to my dad, I, I don't know. But that's a, a, another nice thing about the book is that there's over 200 photographs in the book. And so you can visualize everything you're reading about and many, many photographs taken by Belgian people, why he was in hiding uh, of him and his, and his helpers that are just like, you know, one of a kind pictures. Yeah, that are just priceless. Yeah, no, priceless, I'm sure, especially to you. I think that's one of the things that made the book so enthralling was you could visualize as you were reading, you know, you saw pictures from the actual 
event that was taking place that you were describing. So that made it much more captivating to read. But the Allies did invade at Normandy on D-Day, and they, they pushed their way through France. And ultimately, you know, they get to where your father is, and they liberate Belgium. So what happens to your father once he comes into contact with American forces, whom he hasn't seen for months? Yeah, it was on September 2nd, you know, about seven months after he bailed out, that word came that there were U.S. troops in the nearby village of Trelon, France. So he walked in the, the town. The town square went up to an army major, actually, with an element of Patton's Third Army, which had come up through France after D-Day, and identified himself. They interrogated him to make sure he wasn't, you know, some plant. And then uh, he caught a, a, a riot on a convoy taking German prisoners to Paris, and then in Paris, he, he hopped on a transport and made it back to, to England, where he sent a Western Union telegram to my mother saying he was back at base and fit as a fiddle and will write soon. Um, and so, you know, that was very tough on my mom because she was, you know, they were shot down on February 8th. She got a telegram on February 23rd saying his mission in action. And actually, my other sister, Nancy, was born when my dad was missing in action. So here's my mother back home with a one-year-old daughter, Susan, and a little infant, Nancy, never knowing that if she would see her husband uh, again. So that was a glorious moment uh, for them and for you know, my dad's family and uh, my mother. I'm sure. I'm sure it was probably one of the most relieving moments of her entire life because that was actually going to be my follow-up question. You know, How hard was this time for your mother? Because... She gets the the telegram that he's MIA, and then she doesn't hear for seven months, and he's in action in Belgium, escaping the Germans. I mean, I can't imagine the strain and the stress on on your father, but also your mother. She was probably just as stressed with you know a one year old daughter and an infant with not knowing the fate of her husband. Yeah, uh, a very poignant uh, portion of the book here, are excerpts from all the letters that were exchanged between the wives and the mothers and the sweethearts of the crew after they all got this letter saying that their loved one was missing in action. Um, there were some of my dad's crew that were captured and became prisoners of war who were able to write home. So they found out that those three guys were safe and they also found about, about the two crewmen on the plane who were killed. Uh, by the German fighters during the attack. Um, so they knew what had happened to five of the crew, two dead, three prisoners of war, but they didn't know what happened to the other five members of the crew. Um, and uh, the tail gunner of my dad's crew, he also evaded, although unlike my dad, he, that, who was moved from place to place to place, he stayed with the same woman and her two daughters in their house in Chimay for the entire seven months. He, he was just a young guy. He was only 19. He celebrated his 20th birthday there, and he was scared to death. He never, you know, he was afraid to death to go outside because he was so uh, scared that the Germans were, were going to catch him. But, uh, you, know, the, you know, once my dad came back, back and then Bill Schlenker was the tail gunner's name, uh, a few days later, you know, he was able to uh, communicate with with his lo his loved ones, but they didn't find out what happened to three of the remaining three crew members on my, on, on my dad's crew for uh, over a year later after the war in Europe ended, because all the, the 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 U.S. military, the Air Force, said is that they were missing in action and assumed killed in action. But uh, Derwood Ike, the father of George Ike, the co-pilot, he would not accept that answer. So he went to his senator, uh, they lived in upstate New York, in Rochester, uh, and he got the senator to, to get the work uh, crimes department to do a full-blown investigation of what happened to uh, his son and these two other members of, of, of the crew, and they found out then, you know, that they had been killed by the Germans. The atrocities committed by the Germans, we all know. I mean, hor horrible and, and tragic. And the uncertainty, I'm sure, is, is probably, you know, one of humanity's greatest fears is uncertainty. And the uncertainty that all the wives lived with, you know, the people your, like your father and his crew, uncertainty of their fate. Just the strain is... is 
unimaginable, undescribable. But one of the questions I'm most fascinated to hear is how your father's perception of the war may have changed after being on the ground. Because as a bomber, you have a unique perspective of the war. You get up in your bomber and you fly and you drop bombs on your target, but you're not really seeing the destruction and the violence up close and seeing the result you know, of your actions. But being on the ground, I'm sure he did see, you know, shelled cities. He did see the violence of the Gestapo and the SS and and the Germans, you know, killing collaborators and killing Americans. So did his perspective of the war change after seeing it on the ground level up close? Well, that's a that's a real good question. You know, when they did see the destruction, you know, when they were when they went into England, because they saw, you know, the, the bombings and they had the, the air raids and stuff. So, so they could saw the destruction that the Luftwaffe was doing uh, uh, to, to Britain, to, to England. But like you say, you didn't have that face-to-face. -face. You know, it was kind of impersonal. You're dropping bombs at 25,000 feet. And you, really, you see them explode, but you really don't see the, the, the destruction. Um, and there wasn't really much destruction in... In, in Belgium, uh, when when he was there, because like Charleroi, and, uh, he was in the Belgium was divided in two. Uh, the northern part is called Flanders, which is rather industrial, like Antwerp, the big uh, base where Brussels is, and then the, the bottom half of Belgium is called Wallonia, and it's all rural farmland, and they speak French in Wallonia, and they speak uh, Flemish or a dialogue of Dutch in the north, so. There really wasn't, there, there weren't any battles really fought or bombing done in southern Belgium. Um, so he didn't see the, the destruction. He, he saw the, the cruelty and, you know, what the, the occupation was, the Nazi occupation was, was like and the Nazi oppression. But, you know, but it's a very good question and uh, one that I, I, I really can't answer adequately, I don't think. Uh, you know, I, there's so many questions. I, I know so much, you know, and, and my dad lived to 91, and we t talked about the war, but, you know, I, would, I have so many questions I wish I would have asked him, you know, about how he felt about stuff. Because I, 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 you, know, you find out what happened, you know, the facts, and that's what you kind of uh, concentrate on. And you don't stop and think about the whys, you know, and the hows, until now, you know, it, 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 it's too late. My dad wasn't the last crew member to die, but he was the oldest uh, at 91. Wow. I mean, it's also a tough question because, you know, like you said, Belgium wasn't really as as shelled as, you know, Germany was. So he probably didn't get to see the result of the bombing, um, the American bombing that is up close. But he definitely did see the violence of the Germans. And I'm sure that that probably wasn't something he necessarily wanted to talk about because, I mean, just how cruel it was. But he eventually makes it back to your mother. He makes it back to America. But years later, you actually get to go to Belgium with your father and visit all of these places, which you've been alluding to earlier. You know, you say you've been to all these places. But what was that experience like for you to be able to go with your father after you know your fascination in his story and see all of these places and hear all of these stories and seeing it in first person of what actually happened at the place you're standing what was that experience like for you oh pretty incredible um i will say like most world war ii veterans my dad didn't talk a lot about the war until 1989 and that's when uh this local Belgium organization, the uh, Belgium American Foundation that was formed by Paul Delahaye, who was a young boy during the war and greatly affected by it, uh, formed the organization and started erecting, memor erecting memorials to honor the, the U.S. troops who came to their rescue. Uh, and so they, they erected a memorial to my dad and his crew in 1989 and my dad and the three other members of the crew that were still living at the time went over for the dedication and there they were re my dad was reunited with all these Belgian people that had helped him and revisited these places where he was hidden and that brought it all back and he started talking about it after that and then five years later in 1994 
for the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Belgium and my dad's plane being shot down, um, my wife and I accompanied my parents over to attend the 50th anniversary. And like you say, that that's when it became personal for me because I was able to actually meet only one of my dad's helpers uh, I, I met on that uh, on that trip. The others had passed away. Um, but I was able to see a lot of these places where he was hidden and go around, you know, and see it firsthand. And it was an amazing experience. And the Belgian people are wonderful people. To this day, they're still so thankful and full, so grateful for the Americans coming to the rescue and for all that allied, uh, you know, the, the Brits and the Canadians coming to their, their rescue. And they treated my dad like he was the president of the United States. This one time, we were there was a, a band concert and a, a, a dinner, and we were a little bit late. And they had a, it was in a, this a big, huge tent with hundreds of people. And we come walking in, and they all stand up and start applauding, you know. And it was very moving. They treated my dad like you know, he, he single-handedly, you know, liberated him. And it was it was incredible the way they, they treated him. And then I've been to Belgium six times now, and I'm going for the seventh time this fall for the 80th anniversary of the liberation of, of Belgium and, and my dad's plane being shot down. But on the second time I went with my my wife and I went in 2004. Uh, my dad was too uh, wasn't well enough to make that trip. It was very embarrassing to me because they they were treating me like, you know, I had fought in World War II, and just because I was the son uh, of of the pilot. Um, it, it, so I, I I've made some dear uh, friends, and every time I go over there, I find out a little something new about the the shot down story. Um, get into another house that I hadn't been into before, um, or, or find some other little, little, little something. It, it's just incredible, and you know because this area is so rural and no fighting took place, everything is just like it was 80 years ago. I mean, and you can go and visit all these locations where the shot down story took place, and you can you know see where history. Uh, you know, took place, you know, not only in my dad's history, but, you know, what what happened to these other downed airmen of his crew, too, you know, and where the guys were captured, where they stayed, where they were shot, you know, and it's just incredible. Yeah, that is incredible. And that's one of the most profound things to me when it comes to history, because obviously I love history and American history, but being in those places where these events actually happen gives it a different a different perspective when you're actually there, it's just, it gives it a whole new level of appreciation. And I'm sure it was even more profound for you because you have that personal connection to the story. But you say the Belgian people are extremely thankful of the Americans. I mean, we're extremely thankful for them because they're the ones who helped our, our downed airmen, you know, escape and, and get back to their families. So I'd like to applaud the Belgian people for that. But you briefly talked about the story earlier when you actually met the German fighter pilot who shot down your father, which is just, like I say, again, incredible. But what was that moment like when that moment of realization hit, when you got that message back from him, however you reached out to him, and you get that message back, and you realize it, it, you're going to meet him, and then you see him in person? What What does that moment feel like? Because I can imagine... A lot of people might feel some sort of hatred, but I know in your case, that's not it at all. Like you said, you're great friends. Yeah, when I you know, found that he was alive and, and spoke English, I was so excited. Um, for the book, I just interviewed him over the phone and through email. Um, it wasn't until a couple of years later that I made my first trip to actually meet him in person. And... Uh, you know, at first when I contacted him, I was just bombarding him with question after question. One time he goes, Steve, I really don't even know you that well, and you're asking me all these personal questions. Um, but I built up his trust, you know, and well, you know, he said it was unfortunately they had to be shooting at each other, but uh, that was war. You know, he was pretty much just like one of the U.S. airmen. You know, he was 19, 20 years old, fighting for his country, trying to do a job and trying to, trying to stay alive. Um, but uh, the first time I met him, I went over with my son, um, my youngest son, 
who was actually an, an actor at, at the time, and a, a friend of mine who was a motion picture cameraman in, in Hollywood. And so we, uh, we were going to meet him at his uh, apartment in Munich and then go to lunch. And so we went to his apartment. Then he had a, a, a friend of his, actually was a former student, uh, who could speak real good English too because he was a little bit nervous. I think he wanted some support there. You know, here come these three guys, you know. With, and so we went across the street to this nice restaurant, you know, and had some Wiener schnitzel and some German, nice German beer. And then went back to his apartment. And they said, we, we said, we want to interview you. And he goes, oh, oh, oh. And so we start rearranging the furniture. And he's like, you know, just these three strangers come and start rearranging the furniture in his living room so we can set, we're setting up these cameras, you know, we have, we have two cameras on tripods and stuff. And he's going, and so I go, don't worry, you know, don't, don't, don't be nervous, you know. He goes, I don't know what to say. And I go, you don't, you don't have to worry. I'll ask you questions and you just answer the questions. So we sat down there and uh, we filmed an interview. I, I made a little 13 minute uh, documentary you know, footage from our interview is uh, contained in, but that was just, just really fun. And you know, he he relaxed, and 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 yeah, you know, we had a really good time. And he he took out his log book, his flight log book, and showed me his entry. You know, on February eighth of nineteen forty four, where he, you know, jot noted where he shot down a B seventeen, and he had to bail out because he was shot down. And his photo album of of him, you know, and his planes and all these other Luftwaffe officers, you know, was, you know, put on his his uh, fighter pilot's jacket and his Iron Cross. He shot down seven B-17s and one Spitfire, but he was shot down three times himself. So uh, he was lucky to make it make it through the war. The really only, the only reason I think he made it through the war that at the beginning of 1945 they pulled him out of combat to be a test pilot for the Henkel HE-162 single-engine jet fighter that the Nazis were trying to perfect, which they never did. But that took him out of combat. Or combat or he probably would have been killed. Yeah, it seems like he could have had a, a book of his own. But, I mean, what a hilarious, what a hilarious story of your guys' interaction. But it's coincidental that we're having this episode now because there's actually a little show, I'm sure you've heard of it, called Masters of the Air airing right now. And, and I've been watching it. I'm I'm up to date on it and I think it's absolutely incredible. I mean, it's really given me a whole new perspective on what it was like for the bombers and how terrifying it was and and the flak and and the mental anguish and the psych psychological stress that these guys went through. But as an expert in the air war of Europe in World War II, I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. Sure, it's funny. You know, I read that book before I wrote my book cuz uh I retired in 2009, and that's when I had the time to really delve into my dad's war history in more detail. And after reading his diary and reading all those letters, I just became passionate about it. And I started reading book after book about the air war, and Masters of the Air was one of them. It's interesting that the, the books are about lots of different bomb groups in the 8th Air Force and lots of missions. You know, the, the, the miniseries just focuses on the 100 bomb group. But the picture on the front of the cover of the book is a 306 bomb group crew after a mission on February 4th of 1944, which was a mission my dad flew on, you know, just before, four days earlier than when he was shot down. But I think the, they're, um, you know, being so knowledgeable and, and being about the air over Europe, I look at it again, it kind of a different perspective. Uh, but I think for the, they're doing it, they are doing a fantastic job of uh, depicting what it was like to fly combat missions so that the general public, you know, and people who don't really know that much about the air war over, over Europe, you know, gain an appreciation, like you said, of, of what those guys went through. Um, they're really not touching. You know, I'm going to do my best to try to contact someone in Hollywood about uh, shot down because they really don't, they just barely touch, you know, the, the, the resistance in the underground. You know, that really don't tell that part of the story about the airmen who evaded capture and, you know, not only evaded, uh, but are hidden by the, the Belgian people for lengthy periods of time who are fought with the, with the, with the French resistance. But I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. You know, I, I'm up to date. You know, every Friday I, I watch it. Uh, I've been part of a, a podcast 
uh, here, uh, there's an organization called the uh, Vet Veterans uh, Business Club that they have a podcast every Thursday that I've been on three of them when they talk, they they kind of recap the episode and talk about the, the air war over Europe. But it, uh, it's a lot different from Band of Brothers. Um, uh, I think because of the air war and the impersonal, impersonal you know, you're not that face-to-face -face fighting. And in the cockpit, they have, you know, masks on. And it's, it's not as easy to, to connect with the characters. Uh, they're really not able to do the character development that they were able to do in the Band of Brothers. But, you know, overall, it's, uh, it's very good. Yeah, I would agree with that. The scale in Masters of the Air is much more massive, too. I mean, you have newer technology, you have a bigger budget, so the scale of the show seems a lot larger. Band of Brothers and the Pacific were felt a lot more grounded and down-to-earth, but I think you should 100% reach out to a screenwriter and, and find someone to help you out and make this book into a movie because it deserves to be on the screen, and it is absolutely incredible. If you guys... Want to get a copy of Shot Down? Like I said, the link is in the description. And that wraps up the story of your father. I mean, what a remarkable story. What an incredible journey. And uh, Steve, I want to thank you so much for coming on. It was an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you for having me uh, again. I really appreciate it, Jake. I, uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh -huh.